Chen is the CEO and co-founder of Foria. He came through Math Start Accelerator in 2014 while he was working on this project called Scanned. So for those who don't know, Scanned is a startup that allows you to inspect properties online. And it now evolved to become a massive media company called Foria, where you get to experience the 3D virtual world. Hmm. So without further ado, please join me welcoming Trent. Cool. All right, uh, can everyone hear me okay? Is this all right? All right, yeah, at the back, Brenton, is it all right? All right, cool. Um, awesome, thank you for coming this evening. Nice to see some familiar faces. Uh, my name is Trent, and I'd just like to first start by thanking uh, Carlton Connect, actually. This is a really amazing opportunity, uh, not just to talk this evening, but also to actually be a part of this really cool little ecosystem that we have um, here before us. And it's been amazing for my, me, my team um, and the whole, I guess, MAP program to be a part of a very exciting time in the startup community. Um, so, without further ado, let me begin. So, I guess um, the first question some of you might be wondering is, what am I doing here? Um, who am I to be qualified to talk about virtual reality? Well, I also ask that <laughs> same question. And so, basically, um, I wouldn't five years ago have had any idea that I'd be playing in the space that I'm in today. Um, however, I guess what sort of led me to um, running an immersive media company was really just this interest and fascination with technology. Um, and so when I was sort of trying to question what I was going to be talking about, I thought it would sort of be good to look upon my own life and where I really started. And so. Um, well, there's one particular memory that really sticks out with me, and that's actually the very first MP3 player I ever bought. Um, I remember spending my whole, uh, basically, years saving in pocket money and actually bought a, one little MP3 player that only had a, a mono-piece earphone and had enough memory to play 30 seconds of a song. Uh, pretty ridiculous when you look back at it, but at the time I thought it was amazing. And so we then sort of, I guess, look at where we're at today, and we have you know, the likes of the iPod or ultimately our iPhones, um, the amount of data that we can actually um, store in these smart little devices is really exciting and it's been, I guess, a massive enabling factor to really accelerate uh, technologies like virtual reality. Um, so what I plan to do with you today is actually just sort of go on a little bit of a journey and sort of look at w effectively where it's come from um, and then try and touch on where we think it's actually heading. So um, before I actually begin, I was wondering, um, there's a bit of a dying breed in this room. I like to call them virgins. Um, and I was wondering, do we have any virgins in the room who are yet to actually have tried virtual reality before? Be honest. Awesome. Cool. You're the first one with your hand up. What I would actually like to, what is, what is your name, mate? Ross. Ross. I was hoping I could actually show you a cool little experience for about five or ten minutes if you'd be open to it. Beautiful. So if you just want to help a bit of a Ryan, um, I'll try not to actually spoil it for Ross. But the, the really cool thing, um, we've actually not just got virtual reality, but we also have a, a haptic backpack. And so this little device on, on Ross's back here, I'll touch on a little bit later, um, but it brings another sense into the mix and it just sort of builds on the level of immersion people can effectively feel. And so what Ross is actually going to experience is something called Nerds on Blindness. Um, it's a Tribeca, um, it's a virtual reality film that effectively took Tribeca by storm and it's definitely something, one of the most powerful pieces of VR content I think I've ever experienced in my life and so it's going to be really interesting to see what Ross thinks and then afterwards we're going to have a whole bunch of demos outside so if you want to give it a go we're going to have about several of these up and running. Um, our friends from Learning Environments from the University of Melbourne have also helped out and set up a, a Vive so it'd be good to stick around afterwards and have a bit of a play. Um, and so what Ross is actually experiencing, I just have a, a teaser for it, um, if you could sort of imagine um, trying to perceive what it would be like to, to be blind effectively. So these are recordings of a, um, a gentleman called John Hull and he's basically just narrating his perception as his sight slowly degrades. And then what they've done is they created a documentary but they also had a partner virtual reality experience. And so you're wearing this experience and it's basically pitch black 
But what you can hear all around you are different sounds. It's a 3D soundscape. And within these sorts of parts, they sort of spring up and, and come to life. And it's definitely a very emotive piece. I really recommend it's actually free. If you have a VR headset, you can just download it free off the App Store. Um, so hopefully, yeah, um, Ross enjoys himself. We'll see how he goes when he comes back. Cool. So, um, funny enough, like I run a tech company, but I actually, my background is in psychology. Um, I think I, I graduated a few years ago from uh, a, a, the Australian National University and did my last year here at Melbourne University. Um, and I sort of had this crossroads in my life where I effectively had two decisions. One was this endless sort of curiosity for new tech. Maybe I could sort of take a bit of a risk and see what happens. Or I could sort of go the tried and tested path of further study in psychology and become a clinical psychologist. And so I guess as you can all guess by now, um, I effectively chose to take the riskier path and play in a space that was a little bit more unknown. And so um, the funny thing is though today I've sort of found myself going full circle where I've actually come back into a space where tools like virtual reality allow me to actually explore, I guess, the, the human condition, consciousness and psychology in different ways. But I'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, when I was preparing for this talk, I was actually sort of at the exact same time reading a book uh, called Ready Player One. Um, and this is an awesome book. It's, it's pretty new. If everyone, um, if you ever get a chance to read it, I highly recommend it. But basically, Ready Player One is set in uh, 2045. Um, in a year that we're sort of all, you know, we can sort of estimate is off in the distance where we've got an energy crisis, global warming, overpopulation, and things like virtual reality are much more center stage. Um, and it follows this journey of a, a young boy called Wade Watts. And um, he's what in the book is called a grunter, which is basically he goes into um, a virtual world and he's looking for this sort of hidden gem. And so this gem is actually um, set in a, a virtual world similar to Second Life. Um, does this work? Cool. So for those who haven't heard of Second Life, it's effectively a, just a computer game where you can go out and create a virtual avatar of yourself and live possibly you know, a second life effectively. Um, however, in this game, it's called Oasis, which is effectively the ontologically anthropocentric sensory immersive simulation. Um, but within this experience, he actually has a very interesting description of how it's really enabled him um, living in a slum to effectively explore the world on the same level as everyone else. Um, and one thing that really stuck out to me in this book is he was actually talking about um, his disdain or his, his challenges that he faced in going to school each day. And um, he sort of you know, ridiculed as a bit of a weird character, but what he sort of happened towards the end of his um, education, he was actually able to go to a virtual school. And so in that experience, he was somewhat liberated. He was actually able to have a new identity. If the bullies were trash talking him, he could mute them. Um, but one thing in particular was the ability to go out and explore the world like never before. Um, and so he could actually go on these field trips and specifically he went on a field trip to Jupiter's moons. Um, he went to the Taj Mahal. And this is set in 2045 and I think it's a really fascinating concept if you think about you know, how amazing it would be to open your book and effectively jump inside to these new worlds. And so whilst that sounds like quite a fictional possibility, um, there's something more recently um, called Google Expeditions, which is exactly this thing. So um, last year, Google actually released to a thousand different schools around the world these little kits um, that effectively gave the class the ability to go out and explore a hundred different destinations. And it's a really cool experience. It's now actually free on the App Store where you can effectively, as a teacher, um, have control and you could guide people through these little journeys and narrate their experiences. And, um, if you can imagine, you know, they've got experiences that are quite literally from, um, you know, the Egyptian pyramids all the way through to Mars from some of the content that we've got from the Curiosity rover. So I thought this is fascinating. This is the exact same concept that we're exploring in a book set in 30 years from now, but it's actually now available in the palm of our hands today. Um, so this is a really cool, I guess, sort of zeitgeist where we have these predictions on the direction that technology is heading and we're almost accelerating our ability to meet that. Um, and so if I sort of just step back for a second, um, there's been a lot of, I guess, skepticism with virtual reality where we look at, um, it's, you know, obviously started with, within games um, and a lot of people think it's just going to stay there. And so I guess there's a lot of doubt in the ability to actually 
um, overflow into these different industries. But I think here we are today in 2016, it is undeniable the amount of virtual reality sort of media that we're seeing plastered everywhere. The fact that we can actually experience this content from you know, the palm of our hands rather than having to buy these complicated devices. And so I feel two of these really enabling factors are basically the platforms that we all engage with. So here we have two billion, um, two platforms with a billion users, both YouTube and Facebook. Um, YouTube was definitely the first of the punch here. They've now since enabled um, YouTube to play 360 videos. And so you can still view it without a virtual reality headset. You can just click a button and then drop it into something like a Google Cardboard that I'll touch on later. And then with Facebook, um, I watched this video just recently um, and I think it's actually pretty crazy, pretty straightforward. Um, here we have this nice lady, she's just browsing through a news feed and she's got a new piece of content in front of her. Clicks it open. And so it's a very simple experience being able to click and drag around on your screen. Um, but the one thing that really <laughs> stood out was actually the simplicity of going actually now from this platform straight into a virtual reality experience. It is you know, just the, the tap of a, a button effectively. And there you go, you can actually now go from Facebook. So I think this is just crazy. It seems really simple, but to me that was quite profound. So the question is, if we can sort of step back for a second, um, how did we get here? So VR, as I mentioned before, has sort of had this ebb and flow where it gets a lot of hype and interest and then um, quite often it's sort of met with a bit of a sour taste in a lot of people's mouths. Some people feel sick. Um, sometimes it's, you know, heavy and chunky and the fidelity is never going to compare to the real life. But I guess if we can look at the progress we've made, um, I like to draw the um, similarities between the Viewmaster. I feel like for a lot of people is our first sort of you know, very basic VR experience. And so with the Viewmaster, which is made uh, by William Gruber in 1938, um, he was just a hobbyist taking uh, stereoscopic images. And that's really all the Viewmaster is, is just two different images, one to each eye, the same way we see the world. You can then have a three-dimensional image. Something really quite simple, but then you pull it up to your face, your whole view is, is consumed and it really transports you to this new place, which I think is just amazing. Um, and then we sort of question how VR really came into the mix and I found this, this blog online that I thought was really cool. And so basically, um, this one young guy was just sort of pulling apart his Viewmaster and he wanted to put a little LCD screen in because he's like, I can have, you know, infinite stereoscopic slides. And then um, after about four iterations, he had all these different screens and he realized all he needed was his smartphone. Um, it's such an enabling tool for us to, to be able to do this and I guess, here we are today with um, the Viewmaster 2.0 effectively where um, you've got this little cheap inexpensive device and then you can just put your phone in and you're good to go. Um, and I think this is a really cool evolution effectively um, and it's really cool to see where it come from. I guess one thing that is often overlooked with the View, Viewmaster is actually the tools used to capture these types of experiences and so, um, oopsies. Here we have um, just a little personal Viewmaster stereoscopic camera. Um, and at the time, this was a massive deal. You could actually just have something in the palm of your hand and you could catch an image and then you're good to go. Um, and now if you sort of fast forward to where we're at today, um, we can look at these devices like Google VR, um, or Google Jump, sorry, where we now have an array of 16 different cameras. So no longer are you sort of tethered to this one location looking in that direction, you can now actually look in all directions and we're getting to the point now where you can actually move and sort of peek around corners and change a little bit differently. And I guess this is the space that we decided to play with me and my team um, and it's sort of this concept and how you can transport people to these places that initially led to the um, creation of Scanned. And so two years ago we were fortunate enough to participate in MAP. Um, we're still here sort of lingering around like a bad smell. Um, but effectively, what we really used was 3D scanning. Um, this is a, the Matterport camera, one of the devices we use. And this is an amazing tool because on one hand, it actually um, is actually the fastest way to create VR content. So within a matter of hours, you can actually go out and scan a whole space. Um, we've done some, some different buildings that I'll share with you in a second. And so in the past, this would have taken months and cost tens of thousands of dollars. Now we can do it within 24 hours where we can go through a space the same process that you would effectively when you're taking photographs. Build out this model and without having to stitch it all together, we just throw it up into the cloud and I guess we leave it to some computer vision algorithms to do the rest. Um, and then it comes back within a very short amount of time and we can view it on your phone, your desktop and also now into VR, which is really exciting. 
And so we started and we were looking at like a lot of the pain that was felt as it felt on a very personal level, just looking for a house. You get there, you realize, you know, it's not actually at all what you were led to believe. And so what we wanted to do was see how we could bring more transparency to the online inspection to give people a better ability to actually um, accurately just perceive physical space. Um, and so we went on this really interesting journey and um, that sort of led us to um, rebranding as a company because we realized it wasn't just 3D scanning. There's a whole bunch of different tools that can be used to better tell, um, I guess, more engaging stories. And so it really was this concept of immersive media, um, which is effectively just digital engaging media. It can be lots of different things. It can be VR, um, it can be augmented reality, um, it can be sort of virtualizing existing or off the plan space as well, which is pretty cool. And so we realized we were developing all these different skills. And so we were a little bit pigeonholed at the time into scan. And so that actually led to us having a rebrand, which um, I'm excited to share with you all today, which is actually just Foria. And it is this idea of a transformative immersive experience where you can actually have something that is deeply engaging and moving. And hopefully um, Ross is <laughs> having a good time of himself over there. <laughs> My man. Yeah, and so. <laughs> That's good to hear. Yeah, and so really our mission at the time was really just to empower anyone with the ability to experience a physical place in a virtual space. And so it sounds, I guess, a little bit abstract, but I think um, we now have some really exciting tools that make it really straightforward. And I hope to actually share that with you in a manner that you can leave today and actually go out and explore it on your own. Because to be honest, it's not actually particularly <laughs> complicated. And so we have these four different pillars. And what I want to do with you is actually share how um, virtual reality is actually seeped into every single one of these. So um, here we have scans. So we've got the ability to experience any physical space. We then looked at how we could actually more effectively create sort of different types of content. So VR is one of those that led to captured. Then there was a question how you actually experience something that doesn't exist. Um, and that's where plan came in. So being able to walk through an off the plan apartment. And then something um, that's very exciting for us is also dreams. So how can actually virtual reality be used as a form of social good? And I'll sort of elaborate on these in a little bit more detail. Um, so SCAN primarily was just working within the property space. We started, we've had an interesting challenge trying to change a lot of traditional behaviours. Um, but we're really making good progress now. We're actually partnering with some really innovative, open-minded movers and shakers in the real estate industry. And so just to give you a sense, this is actually um, the Melbourne School of Design, which is an amazing architectural building just across the road there. Um, and so what we've done is we've done two different things. We've flown a drone around the exterior and we've taken just a, bun a bunch of stills. So we don't even need a specialised piece of equipment anymore. And then using that, we've used also the Matterport scanner on the inside and we can then combine them together and then have a different way that we can actually interact and explore these different spaces. And so one of the driving and enabling factors here was actually this shift that had taken place in the last 24 months, which is really just the fact that we consume more content on our smartphones than our desktops. And so with that, sort of the way we engage with um, content online has changed entirely. And so it's really been an enabling factor for VR. And so some examples that we've sort of done with some of our clients um, is Metricon. So Metricon, um, I guess, are one of Australia's leading home builders. And effectively, they have this massive challenge where they have these beautiful displays littered all throughout the country. They've got 100. But if you were to actually choose one um, that you really liked, it might be you know, a four-hour drive from here. And so you only ended up having about three or four different properties within you know, an hour's reach. And so they've got this beautiful selection, but they can't quite access it. So what we're doing now with Metricon is we're actually scanning all their displays and then actually converting them um, into virtual reality walkthroughs. And so the idea is now... <laughs> cool. Any single display across the country, you could effectively walk in and then put on a VR headset and then go and explore all 100 or all 1,000 different variations of the home. So we're trying to sort of make it a little bit easier. We're bringing that proximity in to make it a lot easier to sort of explore and experience space. Um, one of the challenges we've had over the last couple of years is actually data. So we would go to see a lot of agents and they'd be like, oh, nah, that's a novelty. I've seen this stuff before. I'll see you later. Um, so we realized we actually had to really take a step back and partner with the property portals to look at the actual metrics that we could track. And so having done a thousand properties now, we've since actually realized um, that by putting more content online, by giving people, buyers effectively more control of what they see, you then ultimately um, 
get, becoming more engaged and de developing a deeper relationship with that space. And so it's the same sort of idea that if you didn't put the price online, people aren't going to buy it anymore. But if you put that content out, we're all switched on enough to actually know exactly what we're after. Um, and so we see some really interesting trends happening in the US as well. All good? Yeah. Sweet. There's like four different sections. So I wasn't sure if we'd go for just the first, but he's must be having a good time. <laughs> and then outside the realm of real estate, we've actually, since the very beginning, have been doing a lot in heritage, um, in, in our cultural heritage effectively. And so working with the National Trust, we've actually started documenting a growing catalogue of the heritage sites. So this is actually Mulberry Estate, which is where um, Picnic at Han Hanging Rock was written by Joan Lindsay. And what we're trying to do is actually capture the space in different ways and give people different ways to actually experience it. And so if you can sort of think, right now it's never going to quite compare to the same experience of going there physically and sort of seeing it for yourself. But the question really is what happens when that space is gone or forever lost? We only really, I guess, realise these things when it's a little bit too late. And so what we're trying to do is a little bit more proactively go out and actually just start documenting these spaces and make them accessible so in the event that maybe something awful happens, at least we've got it immortalised somewhere in a virtual replica of sorts. And so with Scanned Aside, one thing that we've really been trying to pursue within Captured um, is basically a software product that can take a 3D model and do lots of really cool stuff. And so the first thing we're able to do is actually, um, we're at a point now where the same amount of time it will take you to go out and create a black and white floor plan of a house, we can actually in half the time scan it and turn it into a 3D model. And then using software, we can automatically produce a floor plan for free. And so it's no longer this sort of cost prohibitive thing, it's actually quite disruptive in how great a substitute it can become. And ultimately where we'd like to go with this is to effectively, um, every place we scan, you can then have a VR sort of ability to inspect it from anywhere in the world. Uh, let's sort of skip through this. And so I guess on the left here, we've got our sort of core focus of the, the property sector, where we're looking at you know, residential, commercial, home builders, uh, events is a really good one. But we've also been doing in, um, uh, a lot of really exciting projects outside the box. So um, for instance, we've done a, an immersive wine tasting where we basically did a little journey with the chief winemaker for Wolf Blast and we sort of followed him around and and the idea was um, they could put up a little pop-up shop, say, in like Shanghai Airport, and then someone whilst they're waiting for a flight could actually, you know, transport themselves to the Barossa Valley and go on this little intimate journey with the chief winemaker one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and the really interesting thing about that was right now it wasn't necessarily like a commercial project that we're rolling out. What we're trying to effectively do is just facilitate a bit of a behavioural change. And so the thing um, that we did with the wine tasting was we surveyed a lot of the... Um, uh, the executives from uh, Treasury Wine Estate and they weren't quite sure about the commercial application of VR. They sort of saw it as a novelty and I think it was like an average of like three out of ten actually saw there being an actual immediate application to their business. After the experience we actually surveyed them again and actually asked how they s saw it, the value and could it be used and we got an average of around eight or nine out of ten. So it was a really good success for us because what we're trying to do is show people that VR isn't just for games anymore, it can actually spill into a whole bunch of different spaces. And so um, one of these areas is, is tourism, as you could imagine. So we had a really fun project um, with, with an event here. And what we're trying to do is actually people that maybe come to Melbourne for a day don't necessarily get a chance to go out and explore the city. So we use 360 video here and we've just got some interesting shots. So here we've got running out with the Hawks onto the MCG. Um, and whilst it looks a little bit different here, it's actually just sort of skewed out and sort of um, put into a two-dimensional plane. Uh, but what Ross is, is actually experiencing here is um, probably about a frame this big. And so wherever he looks, he can see around. So this is almost like a map in, along that sort of similar sense where it is representing this spherical thing, but you can also edit it and play with it in a two-dimensional way. And so when it comes to creating this type of content, there's a whole bunch of challenges that you, that I guess we've had to face and you don't quite realise what they are until you, you find yourself butting up against it. The first one is really how do you storyboard something like this? When you can look around in every single direction, how do you actually plan a shot by shot sequence? The whole, I guess, um, landscape changes entirely. And then also, how do you control what people look at? How do you sort of guide them in a direction if they can actually sort of, you know, get distracted from the hero's sort of narrative and then look around at the, the vista to their side there? Um, 
And then lastly is, is how do you sort of engage with them to, to sort of bring in different senses? So um, one thing we found um, is also the ability to bring in audio and soundscapes because right now when you're in a, a VR environment, whilst you sort of have this sort of stereo headphone on, you can actually look around and use um, audible cues to guide people through. So it's an interesting sort of learning that we've had. But if I can step back to, to storyboarding for a second, um, there's a few different ways you can do this. And so here's just an example of what a 360 or VR storyboard would look like. And so what we've got here are these four different shots um, pointing out in each direction. And so the first thing is you can see up top there in the middle, you've got this sort of point of interest looking you know, down the hall at, at this, um, this little silhouette here. And then on the right, you've got these lockers, window to the left. And so you're trying to plan out these sequences before they've even happened. And it can be quite challenging. So we've been experimenting with how we can actually build on this even further. And so one key element is really, as I mentioned, how you, how you guide people through these different spaces. And so it really is this point of interest. You're sort of like planning someone to capture their attention and actually sort of guide them in a way that is very much seamless rather than having this sort of disjointed journey. And so what do you do in a shot like this where there's actually lots of different points of interest? So how do you sort of work around this? Um, and so the first thing is actually getting this sort of panorama image and actually imagining that it's more like a sphere. And so this is just a little cool representation which is called a, a little planet. And so using this, you can sort of get a sense for the entire view all around. And when you're actually stitching it together shot by shot, you know where that one shot sort of finishes and where the next one begins. Um, and so what you're effectively trying to do is, is have a bit more of like a, a linear sequence rather than having this sort of jumble mess all around. And so you have something that looks like the core of an, of an earth where you've got sort of this start and finish sequence. And so you bring it together and people have like a very um, guided, seamless journey through this experience. Um, another interesting thing as well is, is people look at these sort of 360 cameras. We'll, we'll put one out there actually, and, and we've got one right here. Um, this one's a little bit more sort of inconspicuous. But things like if you could imagine that Google Jump, um, it's a very odd looking device. And so when you're in VR, you, you actually are that device. You're not just sort of um, you know, a camera, you're actually a person. And so you can sort of imagine by looking at this, if you're in VR, how confronting it would be, all these people coming up and taking photos of you. It's a, a little bit jarring in a way. Um, and this is just sort of more so what it would look like um, in a first person perspective, which I think is, yeah, is just a great novelty. And so a lot of the content we've produced will be at like a, like a live event and then we'll have people like looking at you really oddly and pointing at you and, and it still is very much a personal thing. Like you forget that it is just a camera and it's actually a person. So <laughs> this guy's good, yeah. Look very concerned. And so a couple other things, um, three little enabling factors that um, Ross says here as well um, are three really um, powerful sensors. And so what I want to do is cover them in a little bit more detail, but what you're really trying to create is a sense of presence. And that is really done through a synergy, a bit of a dance between sight, sound and touch. And so if you can sort of play with them in a really nice and gentle way, you are really not just creating a video anymore. You're actually creating an experience that someone doesn't feel like they have this thing strapped to their head. They feel like they're actually transported to this new world. Um, and that sense of presence is a very powerful thing and I think that's the magic behind virtual reality and so I just want to cover this in a little bit more detail as well. So um, first obviously is, is a sense of sight and so now that we have you know, f these ridiculously high resolution screens um, on our phones, you know, we can actually have an amazing fidelity in front of us. Um, and so all we've got there on, on Ross's face is just, just my smartphone, just a little S7 plugged in. Um, right now the resolution still has a little bit of growing to do because what you're doing is you're breaking the screen down into half and then you're putting a magnifying glass in front of it. So the, I guess the, um, the quality still has a little bit further to come. But in terms of the capturing and recording of these experiences, um, there is currently a ridiculous amount of options in the market. And so here I've just, um, we've made a little GIF looking at some of the devices and what you can kind of sense here is um, they're all actually just typical video cameras that have sort of been strapped together in a bit of a gobbledygook fashion. And so the funny thing is we're creating all this VR content with tools that weren't really actually intended to be producing this kind of stuff. And so with that, it's quite a painstaking process. Um, Joe, our senior producer there can definitely vouch for that. And what you're trying to do is you've got effectively um, 
say like four or six or you know 16 different devices and you're sort of slapping it together like a jigsaw to create this sphere and then because they're all sort of wide angle lenses you get a lot of distortion so you have to sort of be very um, sensitive with how you sort of design this type of content but I guess the thing is is that they're here and they're accessible and so we've got a little device here that's um, you know point and click it's a purpose-built 360 camera which is really cool um, we've got things like live stream 360 cameras that's really exciting so if you could imagine now like um, anyone in the world could experience any event in real time I think that's a, a very um, yeah fascinating possibility and then when we bring in other sensors so here we have yeah our ability to hear and so what we actually have on the screen here is Paul McCartney's last ever live performance which serendipitously was accompanied with uh, the first ever live recording of a performance and so we've got this really cool um, transitions taking place and so this is a jaunt experience you can download it um, on the app store for free and the amazing thing is is when you put it on and you look to the crowd you know you hear their scream you feel it like it reverberates through you and then you to to uh, turn to the band and then you can actually hear their instruments you know like center stage and so you have a very dynamic soundscape that's really quite powerful and so there's a c couple new little devices coming into the market that I just wanted to share with you and so um, this is a video for a headphone called the OSIC and this was a, a massive um, Kickstarter campaign they, they absolutely smashed it which really I think just represents that people are really hungry for this these types of products and so you can imagine any single soundscape that you're in you know you're not just getting this stereo two-channel experience you really want to take control of, of what you see and and that's exactly what's happening inside um, Ross's experience right now is um, he's really having somewhat a heightened sense of his ability here and so through that you can actually imagine how that could sort of feed in and stimulate different senses. And a cool thing with the OSIC is they've actually got these little drivers. So even though you're wearing like a headphone, um, they now have these little drivers that they can pinpoint sounds um, in 36 different points around you. So even though it's coming from like a very close proximity, you actually now have the ability to sort of trick the ears into hearing different things that maybe they're not necessarily used to perceiving. And so this can feed into VR, which is really nice. Um, and I think it's, there's going to be lots of devices like this coming into the market very soon. And then another one is, is this handsome man, um, Kyle from Nura. So I'm not sure if, if you all have, have heard of Nura, but they effectively just smashed um, Australia's highest ever Kickstarter campaign, which I think is absolutely awesome. Um, and the really cool thing about this device is it actually is somewhat um, personal. It can customise itself to adapt to your own hearing style. And so one thing that's really unique is when you listen to something, your brain, or I guess your cochlea, effectively resonates back your own hearing style. And so this can actually sense and adapt to it, which is an amazing, amazing tool. Um, and it's actually the last day on Kickstarter. So I recommend you all pull out your phones and back these guys, because it's really awesome to see what they're doing and the type of talent that's coming from upstairs. And so lastly within these senses is, is this sense of touch. And so <laughs> I think that's awesome. A uh, bit of product placement. Um, but this sub pack is, is a great little device that feeds in really nicely into VR, but it's also just nice to listen to music. So you can imagine when you're at like a, a live event um, and you know, you're standing near say the, the, the sub and you can feel it just reverberate through you and you become this human tuning fork. And I guess that's a little bit lost when you're listening to to um, music on your headphones and so this is a really good way to sort of bring that back into the mix um, and after you sort of try it more and more what you really sort of crave is, is a whole body suit that you can <laughs> reverberate to and so Subpack are actually doing some really amazing stuff a little bit different from virtual reality um, but this sort of feeds into the exact same experience that Russ is in so um, just our ability to hear and so um, what they did in a partnership with um, a musician or an artist, um, well both called Eskmo, um, is they effectively brought in um, a whole group of just children with sort of hearing disabilities and challenges. And what it actually gave them to do using the sub pack, it just enabled them to actually produce music and feel it. Um, and this is an amazing video, I recommend you just all check it out. But the ability to actually now connect with the lack of sensors through um, different pieces of technology is a pretty exciting concept. Yeah, it's just awesome watching this. And then lastly, um, yeah, so good. 
lastly is actually this sort of tactile experience. So um, the ability to bring our hands in. So it's a little bit weird when you're watching something in VR and you're sort of at like this phantom body. You look down and you're not actually there and you go to look at your hands and there's nothing there. Like it is a little bit disjointed. And in a way that sort of discounts that sense of presence. And so um, this is one device of many that are all coming into the mix where you can now have both a, a haptic sort of feedback for your hands and then you can bring them in and start playing and manipulating objects as well, which is really cool. Um, I should keep moving. And then a, a few other things. So in terms of um, how enabling it's been, we've got these barriers to adoption and I feel um, now with these platforms like Facebook and YouTube enabling anyone to create and share this content, um, the last real barrier I feel is, is cost. So um, this is the camera rig we use, it's 10 GoPros. Um, and whilst GoPros are really good action cameras, they're probably not the very best 360 cameras. Uh, don't tell any of our customers that. Uh, but basically, the amount of time that it takes to create a 360 piece of content is effectively multiplied by the number of cameras you have. So you can imagine now with this 10 camera rig, you've got 10 times the amount of work, and that's because it's got a very fine tuning process. Uh, but what I'm really excited about today is, is actually tools like um, this little camera in front of me, which is the um, Samsung Gear 360. And so this is, um, I feel very much the democratization of the tools to capture and create these types of experiences. Um, under $500 and then you have something like Gear VR which um, is, is also about $150 and so we've got the price just keeps coming down and down and the tools become a lot more user friendly and so I imagine in a very short amount of time lots of people will be creating this content and um, I'd much prefer to see a 360 selfie than a, just a regular selfie. And so on the day that we actually got this, um, we had a bit of a play around just in the office upstairs. Um, we're just sort of mucking around. So to create a one minute video, it would probably take around two to four weeks. Um, we were just, obviously this isn't a very professionally done piece of content, um, but this was done within two hours. And that's from shooting, stitching it together and then putting it onto Facebook. And I think that's just a massive transformation, super disruptive. Um, here we've got black working hard. And so um, a couple other things. I think this is a bit of an ominous look perhaps into what the future might be like. Um, this is the Samsung um, event just recently. More than anything, is just this guy's frown. I think it's, um, he's definitely not having a good time there. Uh, he's obviously an Apple man, so he's probably a little bit concerned. Um, but I think, yeah, this <laughs> it's just an exciting time to see this massive transformation take place. And photos like this are a little bit jarring. We're like a little bit sort of concerned as to what the implications of this might be down the track. But I think all in all, if we're cognizant of these tools and how we can use them, um, then I think we're ultimately going to be using them for good. And so some good examples. Um, recently, Google I.O., um, which it, uh, they launched Daydream. And so Google started a few years ago with Google Cardboard, um, which is just this little sort of cardboard device here, um, which we all also actually have a whole bunch of free ones. So before you leave, make sure you grab one. Uh, but with Google Daydream, um, what they're trying to do is, is really now raise the bar. So they democratize VR by making this, you know, $10 and then anyone can have a, a VR experience. Um, and so the next step is they're trying to give it a bit more class, a little bit more polish. And so Daydream is, is a, a collaboration between a whole bunch of, um, I guess, um, phone manufacturers. And so there's sort of these three core things that they're focusing on. The first is low persistence display which just means when you look around, there's no blur, like you don't want to be having an action-packed experience and it's all fuzzy. Um, the other is the standard of the computer chips that they use. And then lastly is the latency. So a lot of people initially, when they try VR earlier on, um, there was a bit of delay in terms of you looking around and what you see. And then a couple milliseconds later, you sort of experience what that movement entailed. And so that made people feel sick. And that's really just because the brain goes, wait a second, you know, this is not actually what I should be perceiving right now. And that discrepancy often just results in a bit of nausea. But what Google Daydream are ultimately trying to do is just set the bar and set it quite high. And then hopefully we'll not just have, you know, really accessible devices, but we'll have some amazing content and experiences to enjoy. And so with this enablement of, of VR, um, this sort of led to um, Planned for us. And so basically with Planned, um, we realized that you, it's all good. You can go and experience an open inspection of an existing house, but what do you do about something that's yet to be built? Um, and so a lot of people would look at these rendered images and whilst they look really nice, you sort of know it's not necessarily, you know, the real deal. 
And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to effectively go and get the same content that architects use to make these renders and actually compress it down to something that's small enough that we can drop into VR. Um, so this is just a, a development in South Bank called Shadowplay. And so this was initially an architect's model. It was 10 gig. We then compressed it down to 10 megabytes. And so when it's actually that small, we can start doing some really exciting things. We can throw it in a web browser. So this is actually the first property you can inspect from a property portal online, which is really cool. Coincidentally, it was the first one to sell out. Um, the developer asked us if we could make the rooms feel a lot bigger, but we didn't. <laughs> And then there's different devices. So here we've got um, something called Google Tango, which I'll elaborate on a little bit more. And so this actually gives you the ability to sort of navigate through the space. And so what we're trying to do is give people, you know, a really good understanding of how big the environment is because they're pacing out the steps themselves. They know exactly how one room flows from one into the next. Um, and then obviously, yeah, we've got things like VR, which um, we've got some really just, yeah, fun reactions. And now if we can sort of step back and actually look at the industries that VR is disrupting, I have a couple of good examples outside the realm of property, sorry about that. <laughs> first is um, David Attenborough. This is actually really cool. It's the first um, real commercial application that I've seen of VR. So David Attenborough went out and produced um, two different types of experiences. You could walk with dinosaurs or you could go under the um, deep depths of the ocean and sort of go and find these hidden animals. And so. This is actually showing um, at the Powerhouse Museum in Sydney and this is a ticketed event and it was actually really successful. People are paying money now to go out and actually experience these different types of, of media effectively. I'm really excited about this. I do love IMAX movies. IMAX is also actually making moves into the VR space. They're developing their own headset in partnership with Google. Um, this is a really cool device because it's got two screens and so you have a wider uh, field of view which just makes it more immersive in that sense. And the resolution is, is the highest in the world. So I imagine um, the ability to sort of step inside the likes of Avatar and have a whole new cinematic experience would be a fun one. Um, we've got another one here, which is um, from the sort of science fiction channel called Sci-Fi. And this is really cool in the sense that they're actually co-creating um, both you know, your, tra your traditional scientific um, sci-fi, sorry, and they're also having little pieces of VR that come through the show. And so this is um, just about like a, a virtual reality company in the future and the CEO is mysteriously murdered and the pieces the, of evidence are left in this sort of VR world. And so people can then put on an Oculus Rift or um, a Gear VR and then actually go and have pieces, installments of the show in a whole new way. Um, and then creepily, actually, sci-fi also plan to evolve VR beyond the headset by introducing neurological implants to manipulate the human senses, which kind of sounds like the same plot for the show about someone dying, so I think that's a little bit weird. Um, other ones that we really enjoy is actually music. Um, one thing that really gets people geared up is, is just being able to actually experience a live event. Um, you can sort of look out at the sort of sea of phones in the air that are trying to sort of capture this one perspective. But if you can imagine putting on a headset and transporting yourself back to that moment, I think is really cool. And so here we have Bjork and HTC who've partnered up. Um, they've created the world's first VR music album. Um, the Rio Olympics is going to be broadcast in 360, which is going to be really cool, hopefully. Hopefully everything goes well. Um, and then what about art? If you could imagine stepping inside, you know, your favourite piece of art and sort of reimagining it in a different way. Um, and so this is, yeah, definitely a possibility now. And so you're getting these sort of artistic interpretations through the medium of VR. And then taking it one step further, what if you could step inside your own piece of art? And so this is something that's been yeah, massively popular, which is Google Tilt Brush. And so what this lady is using here is actually a HTC Vive. And so the really cool thing about Vive is it gives you controllers that track your arms in three-dimensional space. And so the ability to use these um, as paintbrushes, I think, um, what did they say, Ryan? Like your, your bedroom is now your canvas in a really cool way. And so you, we actually should have a demo of this up and running after this. So feel free to come and have a bit of a play. And then what's really cool is with these designs, you can then actually export them as a 3D model. And so you could sort of 3D, imagine 3D printing, you know, some of these designs in different ways. This is a very exciting, I feel, possibility because I think we've had to adapt to sort of being an, an artist on a two dimensional plane, but it's not necessarily the same way we imagine things in our mind. And so I feel these tools are in, in a nutshell liberating our ability to say be creative and explore new ideas. 
Um, mindful of time, I should probably burn through this, but where to next? So spatial awareness is the next one. We, when we put people in VR, really often they have this desire to move. So we've had a few occasions where we put someone in VR and then they start sort of walking and into a wall and it's a little bit awkward. Um, and so it's not really their fault. I think it's actually just this desire to have a genuine human experience. And so one thing that's been lacking in VR is, is spatial awareness because you're sort of tethered to a seat and you can sw swivel around, but really you're in this one location looking out upon the world. Um, but we've got some new sort of devices coming into the mix that enable, to enable you to explore your world in different ways. I had a video before with, um, with Plan of, of something called Google Tango. And so that device can actually map your environment. It has area learning as you move throughout it. Um, and so that was a dev kit a couple years ago, but now they've partnered up with Lenovo to make the first consumer device. And so this is the same price as a smartphone now, and it gives you the ability to sort of walk around your house and interact with it in different ways. So um, here we've got um, just uh, a sample of like a home renovation app where you can start dropping in different pieces of furniture, you could test out different floorboards, and you could walk away and you come back and it's still going to be there, which is really cool. I know of some, some smart minds in the audience tonight that are going to be exploring this. Um, so I think this is a definitely exciting possibility because you can imagine the challenges with online retail when you look at this two-dimensional image of a product and you have no real idea what it actually looks or feels like and whether or not that hideous couch is going to suit you know, your bedroom. It's, it's <laughs> a little bit disappointing when it's too late. Um, whereas hopefully tools like this will help you sort of project these images into your world. Um, another is, this is actually a really amazing um, Melbourne-based company, Zero Latency. Um, some of you may have heard of the work they're doing, but Zero Latency have like a zombie experience. And so um, the idea is now you're in this sort of open warehouse and they can track your body with it within the space and you can sort of run around and move freely, which is definitely the direction that we're heading. I think um, Google Tango is really cool because what you might see in this video, they've got these sort of backpacks and they've got all these contraptions sort of, you know, it's quite chunky. Um, with something like Google Tango, all that capabilities, all those capabilities are in your smartphone now, so you can have a similar experience just from your pocket. And so building on this point, when you can actually tell where someone is actually situated inside a physical space, where they are, what they're looking at, you start to get a much deeper understanding of their behavior. So here we have 3D analytics. Another amazing startup upstairs is actually um, black AI and so they're using um, some of the same sensors that we actually use in scanning and they can actually create a really interesting depth map of these environments and so um, these clever guys are actually looking at how they can use um, computer vision to track people throughout environments so you can sort of imagine lots of different applications here whilst it might seem a little bit creepy it's also the same amount of data that you're already being sort of tracked online and so I think this is going to be a massive opportunity and I really look forward to seeing where they end up. Another thing, this is actually, if I was excited about anything, this would be it. Um, this is the Emerge camera. And so what the Emerge camera effectively enables is um, something called light field. And so if you can imagine you have a video, ca oh, a 360 camera like this one, and you've got everything sort of coming through onto this one location, what the Emerge does is it actually tracks um, a, a ray of light and it can actually tell the journey that it's gone through everything it's bounced off and so instead of just getting this one location you start actually getting um, a three-dimensional model in real time and so this is just like a rendition it doesn't it's not a product in the market yet but the the theory behind it is definitely very much sound and so as you can see what they're sort of trying to demonstrate here is you get a, a lot more information from a lot more different points and then you can sort of stitch it together and the same way we can sort of walk around or play with these 3D models, you can actually now animate them in real time. So if you can imagine watching a movie, um, instead of being in this one location, you're actually now standing on the movie set and you can sort of walk around and you can sort of follow a different character and you can explore this space in a whole new way. I think this technology is going to be really disruptive when it comes in, but there's still you know, a bit of a way to go. And so with these types of tools, there's something which is more commonly known as mixed reality. And so when you've got virtual reality, and you combine it with the likes of holograms, what you can act actually do is um, have this sort of blend for um, having this sort of virtual and digital content projected into your physical. And so this is actually a TED talk um, from the lead engineer for Microsoft. And so he's been driving a driving force behind the HoloLens, which is 
um, whilst it looks a little bit fancy there, what you've got on your, on your face is just glasses. And so using these transparent glasses, you can sort of superimpose these, these virtual worlds in different ways. Um, Ross is having a good time. And so what, what's... <laughs> Hopefully he comes out with tears and he's just new man. Um, yeah. And then beyond um, just the idea of having these models, like I mentioned with the light field, is um, something called holoportation. And so hopefully this sort of goes to the next shot. So this is just a proof of concept, but this is actually working. So what they're doing is they're mapping this guy in 3D in real time, and then they can sort of project this out into different places. So here we have a, a hologram in real time of this, of this gentleman. And so there's a really cool piece of a, a, of a TED talk where they've actually mapped out, um, they've used cu curiosity to map the terrain of Mars. And so then they've actually got on the TED stage the terrain of Mars, and they've got they've broadcast they've holoported this um, NASA scientist into this space. So through technology like this, you're effectively in three different places at once. And then what's really cool, and so his daughter's in another um, location, and so he can sort of see her. And what he's able to do is actually sort of capture this moment like it's a memory. Cool. All right. How'd you go, mate? <laughs> What's your initial? Fantastic. Yeah, it was all right. Yeah, it was. Um, it was a different world. It was. It was as if I was being transported into. There was. It was like holograms. Uh, my, I mean, my vision's not great uh, without my glasses, but it was. Uh, it was quite spectacular. Beautiful. Just we, being transported as a fact. Great. Awesome. We didn't miss much. <laughs> the, the, How was the yeah haptic feedback? The um, the visual and the the. The yep. sounds are the things that dominate more than anything else. Great. Um, I mean, the, the, the various scenes that I saw, it started off in a park with all these people playing, and kids and cars driving off and people riding bikes and things Beautiful. like that. Beautiful. Great. It was fantastic. Then you had the rain falling and the sound of the wind. And I had to follow a bird and I got stuck on the bird for a long <laughs> time. I didn't, didn't realise what I was supposed to do. <laughs> Um, and then ended up in a cathedral mm. and looking up at the mag mag magnificent walls and the choir singing and the beautiful sounds. Do you, do you feel like it could be used for like empathy in a way? Like you might have a better understanding? Very much so. I mean, that was all about blindness and, mm. and uh, you know, using all your senses to appreciate life more and things like that. So awesome. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll just take that off. <laughs> <laughs> a legend. Yeah. Right yeah. Thanks, mate. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. So good. Cool. Well, that's one really good example. I'm going to go into a couple bad examples. Um, one is the question of have we actually gone too far? I'll just touch on this really briefly because I have to. A lot of people ask about uh, VR pornography. Um, really brief, but basically it's a thing and it's increased by 10,000% in the last 17 months. And to no surprise, um, Japan is, is a driving force. They've actually had to shut down events because they're too popular. <laughs> All right, I'll leave that aside. Another is this idea of hyper-reality. When does it become too much? What actually happens when, you know, I guess advertising companies can invade your virtual space and start projecting these sort of, you know, paid advertisements and you can't look away anymore. It's actually in every single direction, which is pretty crazy. And so this is a really nice little video that sort of, you know, paints a very dystopic future of um, virtual and augmented and mixed reality and how it could sort of be used very poorly. Um, but with that aside, um, one thing that has happened to us and actually transformed our own business and very much I feel our lives in a way is um, the power of VR and how it can actually be used as a form of social good. So um, last year we had this opportunity to actually scan um, all of the apartments for the block. And then on, on television, we effectively dropped in all the contestants into VR and had them in a very meta fashion explore their own apartments that they built um, and find these sort of reserved prices. And um, it was a really sort of interesting exercise for us where we basically lined it all up. And then I, um, like a couple of days before we had to deliver the content, um, had to actually leave to Cuba. And I had no idea how it was going to come together. We were waiting for the content to get back. Um, and it got down to the line where it basically on the day that of production, we received it like five minutes before it was due. So fortunately it all came together, but 
through this experience, it actually um, connected with a few different people. And um, there was one gentleman named Paul Johns. And so he was a fan of the show at the time. And what he effectively had done is, is he realized that we had the ability to bring the show to his daughter, who was actually in hospital. And so he, what he suggests is he reached out to the show and he asked if this was possible. And of course it was. So we, we brought it in. Um, and then with that in mind, we actually took it to her and within you know, a matter of minutes, she didn't even know VR was a thing. She put on this headset and she was just instantly like transported to this different place and she's walking around and she's moving and she's excited and she's energetic, full of life. Um, and that was a very much a profound experience for us. And so we realized that there was something, I guess, um, very unique about the tools that we had and the skills that we developed. And we sort of started questioning how this could be used for good. And then he followed up a few days later um, with this really heartfelt message, probably the most heartfelt message I think I've ever read. And it really just encouraged us to think outside the box and explore how we could actually use this for different applications. And so this sort of started the journey of dream for us. And so we have this very much utopic idea that what if your time in hospital was actually the same as going on a holiday? Like what if you could actually enjoy your recovery process and stimulate your, your mind and your body in different ways? And so what we're doing now is we're actually looking at the content that we can use some of the content we can perhaps repurpose and how it can be implemented as a therapeutic tool. And I must admit, being um, in this sort of hospital environment, I've never actually seen such an opportunity. I've never seen such a need for something like this. And the fact that we have all these different intervention techniques, but there's so many cost constraints, I feel this is the beautiful, perfect solution to actually enable a new realm of treatment at scale. And so we've had a couple of learnings in this space. Um, one is which is content. So now we've got all these different cameras and devices in the mix, but I think a lot of people look to VR as if it's the solution, but it's actually that experience inside it. It's the same as looking at a syringe and going, that's the cure. It's actually the catalyst, the ingredient. And so content is really key if it's actually going to um, really take place. And I think now we've got the ability to record different experiences from anywhere in the world at the flick of a button. It's going to be a lot easier to produce this. Obviously, privacy, hygiene and security are crucial. We've also found that VR can teach people how to learn. So um, I live with two doctors and they often share their sort of disdain for reading textbooks and having to sort of research sort of in a very rote learning fashion. But what if you could actually learn by doing? You could actually have a first person view as if you are the doctor giving the procedure that you're planning to deliver tomorrow. Um, they're really crazy idea, but it's so possible today. A couple other things is obviously can be used to reduce pain, phobias and addictions. Um, and, and lastly, is you just are putting the power not in the hands um, of the creator, but in the hands of the patients and the caregiver. So last couple of the things, Shrey keeps giving me eyes. I'm sorry to take up all your time. Um, why VR? So a lot of skeptics. Hopefully, if you're not converted by now, there's a few more little points for you. One is it never gets old. Um, so we had a really fun exhibition for Melbourne Knowledge Week with the National Trust. And so what we're trying to do here was actually a two-pronged approach. So uh, typically, the National Trust sort of members um, are an older demographic. And so what we want to show them is these new tools like virtual reality can actually be used in, in ways to appreciate you know, some of the, the finest things in life. So we scanned all these heritage sites. We've got um, different exhibitions. And people could come into this really unique space and explore it. And then on the other side, it was how could we actually engage a younger demographic and sort of invite them to come and explore the National Trust and engage with their cultural heritage in different ways. Um, and so this is an exhibition that I, th I believe is still running now just at Tasman Terrace. So I'd really encourage you to actually check it out um, because yeah, there's some amazing sites that you just might drive past on a daily basis, but you don't really know until you step inside. And so this could be a nice little gateway <laughs> via the gateway drug. Um, this is another one. You always see something different. So here we just have a, a live music event. See if you can spot, see if you can spot it. This guy, what a legend. <laughs> I don't think you really knew 360 cameras were a thing until at that point in time. Uh, and that's the feedback we get time and time again is people try something in VR and then they try the same experience again and they actually see something entirely different. So you can repurpose it in lots of different ways. Last couple pieces. This is a really beautiful thing. So Google partnered up um, all around the world to basically um, go and document a lot of the um, gay pride events and festivals taking place. And so it was a really cool way for people to connect 
um, in lots of different ways. And so you can sort of imagine um, maybe you're in a country that doesn't have the liberties or freedoms to celebrate something like this. And so using something like 360 video and VR, you can now sort of transport yourself there um, in a whole new way. And so lastly is, is actually it gives you the ability to have a fresh perspective. This is um, obviously everyone's probably familiar with this, um, Game of Thrones. But um, what's really cool is this is actually the most watched 360 video on Facebook. And so you can watch this in VR and you're now at King's Landing having a blast. And then very, very last is, oh, second last, sorry guys, <laughs> is um, just this concept that y as a content creator, you're no longer actually a storyteller good catch, <laughs> you're actually putting um, the viewer, the visitor as they're called in control and so they're actually the storyteller. So with this in mind you're actually creating storytellers which I think is a really cool idea. And so in retrospect now we're sort of looking at where we've come from. So here we are 1972 Pong, what a really cool game. Like at the time this would have been amazing, this would have been revolutionary. It was, we've got awesome. And so now if we sort of fast forward to, I guess, where Pong has come to today um, with virtual reality as the vessel, we have some pretty interesting experiences available and I think it's only going to get better. And so with that in mind, thank you for your attention. Appreciate your focus. Have a good night.